So um, welcome to this um, talk on COVID-19 uh, in people with Down syndrome. So I will make a start. My name is Andre Stridham. I'm from King's College London. I'm a, I'm a, a psychiatrist in intellectual disabilities by professional background, but also a research doctor at uh, King's College London, where we um, run a research program on uh, Down syndrome, but particularly uh, concerning Alzheimer's disease in people with Down syndrome. I'm also the president of the T21RS Society. So the T21 Research Society, which is an international organization uh, for researchers that are interested in issues related to Down syndrome. And I will be joined by Professor Monica Lackenpaul. Um, uh, Monica, I, I wonder if you want to introduce yourself now. Well, actually, you won't be able to because I'm, I've got the uh, share screen already. Um, I'll let Monica introduce herself um, at the end, but she is from University College London and also represents the Down syndrome medical interest group. So, um, you know, when the pandemic first uh, became uh, a concern, um, many people were worried about the potential risk to people with Down syndrome because um, we were aware that people with Down syndrome have additional health issues and that some of these health issues were shown to increase the risk for more severe COVID-19 in the general population, including uh, health risks such as obesity and diabetes, as well as potentially uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we knew already that viral infections and pneumonia, in particular lung infections, um, are an important health concern for people with Down syndrome. And furthermore, some scientists have shown that people with Down syndrome may have unusual immune systems. And um, they thought it could some people uh, put some people with Down syndrome at higher risk for infections such as COVID-19. So um, in the context of these concerns, what we did at Trisomy 21 Research Society is to design an online questionnaire during the first wave of the pandemic to ask caregivers and clinicians to tell us about people with Down syndrome who have developed symptoms of COVID-19. So people who had developed COVID-19. And then we asked them for details about the symptoms that people presented with, the problems they presented with, and the outcomes. For example, uh, whether people were admitted to hospital and if they were admitted to hospital, uh, whether they developed any additional issues. And we also asked about existing health conditions that could be risk factors for worse outcomes in COVID-19. And then, in addition to that, we were fortunate uh, uh, in, uh, in that we were able to obtain data from a national survey of COVID-19 in hospitals in, in the UK, so uh, uh, within which we identified everyone with Down syndrome who have been admitted and then compared them with COVID-19 to people from the general population to see if people with Down syndrome uh, may do worse than expected when they're admitted to hospital. Now, I should say the, the online questionnaire that we did was an international survey. So it included people from, from the UK, but also from all over Europe, uh, the US, India, and Brazil. I wanted to say right at the outset what we were not able to do. So, um, we are not able at this stage to say whether people with Down syndrome are more likely to catch the virus that causes COVID-19. Some scientists think that they may be more vulnerable, in other words, that they may be more likely to catch the virus, but this is not clear to us. Um, and, but we know that some people may have a higher risk of exposure because of where they live. So many people live in uh, care home settings or supported living environments. In other words, they share accommodation with people or they live with their families. And through that, they may be more at risk of catching, of exposure to catching the virus. Um, but we also know that many people have been very good at keeping themselves safe. So wearing masks, washing hands, 
and uh, their families have been able to keep them safe. So it's not clear whether people are more likely to catch people with Down syndrome are more likely to catch the virus. We're also not able to say at this stage how many people are asymptomatic. In other words, whether they may not show any symptoms when they are infected with the virus. We know that there have been some cases and certainly um, some have been reported to us, but we don't know what proportion of people um, may be completely asymptomatic. And uh, the, the last thing that we're not quite sure about yet is how best to treat people with COVID-19, people with Down syndrome with COVID-19 when they develop the virus, but we assume that uh, the treatments that's available in the general population will also work in people with Down syndrome. So just a little bit more detail about the, uh, the data that we had or that I will be presenting here today. So we had uh, uh, the survey had in the data that I will be presenting more than 800 cases of people with Down syndrome with COVID-19. 422 of these were uh, admitted to hospital and uh, most of them have recovered. So the vast majority that we know about have, uh, have recovered from COVID-19. And then the UK survey of people who have, gone, have been admitted to hospital for COVID-19 included 100 people, an additional 100 people with Down syndrome. Um, and we compared them against uh, almost 60,000 with people without Down syndrome who have also been admitted to hospital. So I want to start with um, what uh, symptoms people with Down syndrome might present with if they uh, are infected or if, they ha if they've developed COVID-19. And these are largely similar to, in, uh, to the general population. So fever, coughing, shortness of breath is very similar to the general population. Um, we observed potentially a bit more uh, nasal symptoms, so runny nose, a bit like a cold, especially in children. But again, um, uh, our understanding is that it's also similar to what we might see in children in the general population. One thing to note is that shortness of breath, so if people become very short of breath, then that is associated with hospital admission. That means people are then likely to be admitted to hospital. So are these symptoms different in people with Down syndrome compared to the general population? Um, so what is similar, I've already mentioned, uh, is that uh, I'm going to put on a marker here. So what is similar is that uh, people with uh, Down syndrome present, as I've already mentioned, with, with fever, coughs, and shortness of breath. What was different is by the time people get to hospital, and we're talking here specifically about hospitalized patients, um, people with Down syndrome were more likely to have confusion or altered con uh, consciousness. In other words, being much more drowsy and perhaps be confused about where they are or who they're with. Usually that kind of confusion suggests that people may be more ill and uh, suggesting that people with Down syndrome might be more severely affected by the time they get to hospital. What was less common in uh, patients with Down syndrome in, uh, uh, at presentation in hospital were complaints of pain and feeling nauseous. We think this may be because people with Down syndrome are not able to explain always uh, when they experience pain or otherwise the doctors didn't know how to ask them about this um, because it seemed as the families were more able to recognize these symptoms than the clinicians themselves. So uh, next, uh, we looked at what existing health conditions may increase the risk for poor outcomes of uh, COVID-19 in people with Down syndrome. So by poor outcomes, we mean either having to be admitted to hospital or dying. Um, and so what we found was, and I may have to explain this uh, slide a little bit. So in orange are all the risk factors that we identified are definitely associated with worse outcome. In orange are the ones that are potentially associated with worse outcome. In other words, it looked like it was more common in people with worse outcome, 
but it didn't quite reach statistical significance. And in gray are the ones that we are sure, uh, in, at least in our data, uh, was not associated with increased risk. So the higher risk factors uh, included age. So just like in the general population, the older people are, the more severe the infection seems to be. Um, but particularly in people with Down syndrome, after the age of 40, we observed uh, quite a significant increase in severity. Obesity, so if people were overweight, then that may put them at higher risk. Um, older adults with Alzheimer's disease were at higher risk. As in the general population, men were at slightly higher risk than women. And it also looked overall that uh, people with congenital heart defects, whether those were uh, fully treated with surgery or not, seemed to be associated with increased risk for hospitalization, but we didn't observe an, obs uh, an increased risk for mortality, for death. Um, I must say though that um, sometimes these findings may be due to having small numbers of people who have been affected by some of these risk factors. The potential risk factors included reflux. So we think that is because if people have reflux, then it could uh, affect their lungs. Obstructive sleep apnea, another condition that affects breathing. Chronic lung problems could affect breathing as well. Um, and in children, it also looked like seizures or epilepsy might be associated with uh, increased risk for hospitalization. So uh, if they develop COVID-19. Um, but we did not find any evidence for increased risk uh, or associated with where people were living, um, whether they have a more severe level of learning difficulties whether they have thyroid disorder or whether they have behavioral difficulties. So what happens when people with uh, Down syndrome are admitted to hospital with COVID-19? So what we found is in comparison to people from the general population, um, some of the complications are the same as common in people without uh, Down syndrome. And that includes heart complications, kidney problems, anemia. But uh, in people with Down syndrome, um, lung complications were more common. So um, if they were admitted to hospital with COVID-19, then um, it seemed to affect their lungs more than other people. So uh, developed some uh, more often bacterial pneumonia. So additional lung infection on top of the virus and potentially also acute respiratory syndrome, which means that uh, the lungs are really, really struggling to cope with the infection. And this is similar to what happens when people with Down syndrome develop other infections, other viral infections such as flu. So we already know that uh, people with Down syndrome do seem to have slightly weaker lungs and can, uh, can develop lung problems on top of other infections more often than in the general population. And if people are admitted to hospital, so we're talking here about people who are more severely ill, this is not the overall num uh, population. These are the people who are more severely ill and have had to be admitted to hospital. The overall risk of dying seemed to be similar to the general population overall risk of dying when they are admitted to hospital. So you can see that in the chart. Um, people with Down syndrome are here at the bottom. These are the ones that have died, men and women. So more men, men are more at risk. But that's fairly similar to the general population in the UK who have been admitted to hospital, men again and women. However, that doesn't account for the fact that people with Down syndrome were younger when they were admitted to hospital. So um, to make a more direct comparison, we plotted here in this graph, the age ranges, and you can see people with Down syndrome in red and the proportions of uh, people that have died, um, uh, of older adults that have died with Down syndrome when admitted to hospital are comparable to the very old people in the general population. 
So we think that the risk in a person with uh, Down syndrome over the age of 40 are in keeping with the risk in uh, uh, adults in the general population over the age of 80. So that's the, the risk is comparable to adults over the age of 80 in the general population. Good news is that few children with Down syndrome die due to COVID-19. In fact, we haven't uh, in the hospital survey in the UK, no children with Down syndrome have died with COVID-19. Um, in our international survey, we found a very small number, four children that have died globally with COVID-19. And those children um, seem to have had uh, more severe uh, health conditions and uh, were also living in countries where they may not have had um, uh, access to appropriate care. So um, just to summarize uh, the take home messages, if, if you're monitoring somebody with Down syndrome for COVID-19, you should look out for the same symptoms, fever, cough, shortness of breath. Shortness of breath is an important one to look out for because uh, as the shortness of breath increases, uh, it may mean that the person is uh, worsening. Uh, and the same with change in consciousness or confusion. If people start to become very drowsy and become confused, then that means that um, they, they should be uh, considered for hospitalization. If people are hospitalized, uh, with COVID-19, people with Down syndrome, then uh, lung complications are more frequent. And this is important for their doctors to know so they can monitor for, for lung problems and try and prevent those. Um, comparing people of the same age, gender and eth ethnicity, adults with Down syndrome over age 40 seem to have a greater risk compared to patients without Down syndrome. And in fact, the risk is similar to, to um, uh, age, uh, adults age 80 and older in the general population. We only know of very few children with Down syndrome globally that have died of COVID-19. And uh, this suggests that both children with and without Down syndrome do not often get severely sick from the virus. Finally, I just wanted to, uh, I'm not gonna read this, but uh, just mention that as with any research, there are some limitations to the work that we've done. Um, uh, you could probably have a look at this yourself and uh, ask us any questions. I'm going to stop sharing so that we can go ahead and um, ask for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. And Monica is now unmuted. So just to say hello to everybody, I'm Monica Lackenpaul. I'm a professor of integrated child health at UCL, um, University College London. Um, I'm also a practicing pediatrician and work in North London and lead the Down syndrome children's pediatric clinics there. Um, so thank you for all joining us. And Andre's kindly presented all the data that's been um, collected on, in, for this study, um, which is an international study. Um, and as Andre's explained, with any research, there's always limitations. And I think it's important to have the discussion that we're going to go ahead with, understanding that research is always ongoing and research evidence is constantly being collected. And the more we research we do for children, the more answers that we will be able to provide for you. But research is never static. So um, I think that that needs to be understood that we are collecting data from different populations in different countries and constantly assimilating this and then trying to help the communities like yourselves with some complex answers of navigating your way through um, the lives, especially during the lockdown, um, coming ahead of us. Thank you. But happy to try and answer some questions. Okay. Julian, over to you. Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. First of all, I mean, thank you both Monica and Andre for really helpful overview of, of the research. And, you know, this was an incredibly popular um, webinar amongst uh, you know our families and supporters because I think very clearly families are thinking about what they might usefully be able to do <coughs> in order to provide as much protection for the, their loved ones so in terms of sort of mitigating factors that 
we might be able to put in place? What would your recommendation perhaps be in terms of something useful that families could think about? Well, I, I mean, from a children's perspective, and I'll leave the adults to Andre, but from a children's perspective, I always think that we should consider children in the context of their whole lives. It's not just about COVID, it's about their whole lives. And um, at the moment, obviously, children will be going through a tricky time being at home at the moment, being locked down at home, um, some of them. And we have to stick to the same rules that we've always been giving out, which is wash your hands, keep the distance, um, make sure you know you keep you know, keep the hygiene rules that are being um, told to everybody. So the rules stay the same; those don't sort of change. Um, but during this time, children will be very anxious, and they may be hearing things about what is going on around them. What does this mean? So I think the first thing I try to say to people is um, find ways to listen to your child. They may not express themselves. They may not verbally express themselves, but sometimes little changes in behavior help you to pick up cues that something's troubling them. And I know everybody's very busy and we've all got lots of things and lots of stress in our own lives going on, but say taking some time out to actually sit with the child and give a bit of space to them to then slowly emotionally be able to offload what they're trying to do. Other tools and techniques you can use are drawings, stories, um, because again, sometimes children, they internalize a lot of their feelings and don't express it very clearly. So I think we have to think of not just the COVID infection as the infection, but what's happening to children generally as a, as a, because of the COVID infection and all the other things that are happening. So in, in addition to that, we might come to more questions about this, but keeping the child healthy with nutrition, having a varied diet. So we know that having a good, good boost of your vitamins and you know, give the child vitamin D. We're in winter, we're not getting sunlight, we are at risk of low vitamin D. So every child should have vitamin D supplements. And actually we're telling every adult to have it as well. So that's across the board. Mm -hmm. Keep general vitamins up in your diet, have a varied diet, make them healthy in the way of activity. So again, at the moment in winter, hard to get active, but if you're sitting on the couch all day long, your muscles, your, your joints are going to start being more painful and more sore and you may put on weight as well which gets the added problem so i'm trying to say to parents have a routine have a very clear routine exercise daily have a routine da daily it can make you be a bit more sleepy when it's dark outside and you want to just lie on the couch and not do anything so again have some activities that the child can engage with keep it fun you know it can become a very worrying time for everybody but if you try and lighten the mood keep it fun for the child as well have some beautiful pictures around do some painting, get them to express themselves. All these things at the moment, they're always important, but I think at the moment they sort of need that little extra um, thought than maybe they would have at other times. Thank you. And I mean, certainly we're well aware, I think, of that interplay between emotional well-being and the impact that that has on physical health. So I think, you know, your comments about that will be very well understood. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the question about vitamin D, Yes. Uh, quite a few people have asked, is there a, a, an ideal dosage? What should people, what supplementation should people be looking for? Yes, the and is that, that differ for children and adults? So the dose is a thousand micrograms. Um, and, but if anybody's unsure, you just go to the NHS website. And um, because there is a different dose, I don't want to confuse people. So it's easiest if you just go to the NHS website. So they have doses for children under one who may be breastfeeding or not breastfeeding. Then they have the doses for the entire population. The thing about vitamin D is there are very a lot of different types of vitamin D that you can get over the counter. So it's important to go and talk to the pharmacist about which sort of vitamin D supplement. The dose is the same, but there might be some that are tablets, some that are chewy, um, those little chewy bear things, some that are drops. Um, so again, it's very important to go and talk to your pharmacist and find one um, that suits your child or, or the adult even. Um, and also there are some that are mixed with other vitamins as multivitamins and some that are completely separate. So again, you might want to think about which one. So the, the message here is it doesn't really matter which vitamin D you have. Take the vitamin D, make sure it's taken routinely. Um, and um, you need to check on the website of what what dose that you need to have, depending on your age, really. Thank you. Um, a question perhaps for both Andre and Monica in terms of uh, vaccination program so not the vaccine not the one that we're all looking to on the horizon but vaccines that are available now so we're thinking about seasonal flu and perhaps um, pneumococcal um, vaccination and there's been some questions about whether the the second pneumococcal 
vaccine is appropriate and for how long that lasts? Is it a one-off um, uh, vaccine or does it need to be boosted? It, it, perhaps one or other of you could, could explain something about that. Um, yeah, so I'm not an expert in vaccination, but we recommend that uh, people definitely uh, should have the flu vaccines, um, particularly this winter. Uh, and of course, as you know, the flu vaccine is something that you have to have every year because uh, it covers different viruses each year. Uh, with regards to pneumococcal vaccine, at the moment, the um, NHS guidance is for uh, babies to be given the vaccine, I think, and Monica can confirm, yeah. as well as older adults over the age of 65. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't capture the population with uh, people with Down syndrome very well, because we know that uh, aging related concerns and frailty and so on um, uh, occurs at younger ages in people with Down syndrome. And so we, 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 we're hoping to, or we're continuing to have discussions with the Department of Health to think how we could best um, target um, people with Down syndrome for the pneumococcal vaccine. I know that some doctors do give it to adults under the age of 65 with Down syndrome, and certainly in, in other countries that may well be the case. I can't speak to how effective that might be, um, but uh, I think that's another vaccine that might have to be given um, uh, uh, several times, but not as frequent as the flu vaccine. M maybe Monica could add to that. Um, just coming back, I think I made a mistake with the uh, dose of the, um, uh, the vitamin D. It's a thousand units, not a thousand micrograms. Okay. So that I need to, I need to retract that. Sorry, yeah. it's a thousand units. So I don't want to, to, to trouble anybody who's thinking, my gosh, that's a very high dose. Yeah. A, so just to clarify fully, it's a thousand yeah. units. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I mean, lots, I mean, it's very helpful that Monica particularly and Andre in terms of the research gave an overview of how this, or what the picture looks in terms of children. And, you know, thankfully it seems to be that the, um, uh, pictures is, is as encouraging as it can be. We've obviously had lots and lots of questions from parents of younger children who will know that adults have now been added to the clinically extremely vulnerable list and are wondering, and I think you have given that reassurance in terms of there's an absence of lots of evidence to suggest that children with Down syndrome are, are very severely affected by, the, um, uh, by COVID. Um, it, what what would your comments be particularly about younger adults, particularly in the sort of early adult age who maybe are at college? We've had lots of calls through to the helpline where um, colleges are taking it. I think it's, it's an understanding that the, the addition to the clinical extremely vulnerable list is guidance. It's not an instruction that you must remain at home, but some colleges and other providers are taking this very much as sort of mandatory. And it's about what advice would you give to families to try and get some individualized advice perhaps from a GP and how far they should then be able to feel that they can push this and say no actually we're making a, an informed decision for our young adult particularly maybe to carry on going to college. Mm. I think that's a difficult one um, so as you've mentioned the, the guidance at the moment in the UK applies to adults uh, 18 and older um, and it's advisory so um, uh, all the GPs will will be writing to patients with Down syndrome, I understand, um, um, to provide them uh, with reassurance that they could have extra support and also to advise about the government guidance. Internationally, maybe I should start with, um, uh, internationally, uh, the view is that um, that one should also consider quality of life issues in people with Down syndrome. So um, the Trisomy 21 Research Society has recently put out a, um, a statement to say that uh, uh, perhaps one should try and balance the risk against quality of life issues. We know it's really important for people to be to continue to be active, to continue to engage in things that they enjoy, to continue to engage in education. Um, but, um, uh, but it's difficult to know, you know, uh, where to draw the line, as it were. So it looks like the government in the UK has been very cautious, uh, which in one, one way is good. But on the other hand, 
um, uh, at international level, I think the guidance is that perhaps those over the age of 40 should be taking uh, extra care. Whereas in people under the age of 40, one might want to look at the individual risk factors. And um, uh, if the person is very healthy and do not have uh, lots of other risk factors, then perhaps one could um, weigh the risk against quality of life factors slightly differently. And I, I'd be happy to say a little bit from a pediatric point of view, because we have also young people who are going into college or um, in education. And I think it's always difficult, you know, government, everybody has to make a recommendation. Where do you, where do you draw the line with your recommendation? So I think the recommendation is there as guidance, as we said, but each child or each young adult is not the same as each child and each other young adult. Um, and so there may be some young people who are very vulnerable, not just because of having Down syndrome, but may have other comorbidities. So they may have um, problems with their immunity. They may have other things that may be um, causing them to be more at risk. And again, there are um, criteria for children under 18 anyway. We have criteria where we do say that if the children fit into this certain criteria, such as low immune systems um, for a particular illness and all, all of the different illnesses are there on the website to be able to see, then you may say they're much more vulnerable than another child with Down syndrome. So we all know all our children are very different and they all have different health risks as well. And I think that's, diff that's the tricky thing with Down syndrome. It's, it's not always the Down syndrome, but we have to think of all their other medication they may be on for other reasons, their other illnesses they may be having. And therefore the guidance is there because there's a recognition that we need to be careful. However, as, as Andre said, you know, we have to think of each individual person and each individual young adult and then weigh up the risk and benefits. And each family will do that themselves, um, partly from thinking about what are the risks of keeping the young person at home and not having engagement with other people or not having education. What are the risks to their health? Some may have a lower risk, some may have a more of a risk, but it, one size doesn't always fit all, but we understand that the government obviously has to give some guidance to help people. We, sorry. Uh, to, just um, to pick out uh, on some of the other questions that are coming in to chat, and thank you for um, typing them in. On uh, college, uh, we've had the query about colleges saying people couldn't, shouldn't come into college. Um, we're going to be talking about that in more detail at this afternoon's webinar, but they, you know, our understanding is they shouldn't be saying this, and we have been advising parents to go back to them to make them aware that they shouldn't be. And we know that colleges have then changed their minds and then done what they should be doing, which is risk assessments and looking at individual cases. And also somebody in the chat has given um, an example where uh, of better practice where this has been looked at more individually. So if you haven't already joined this afternoon, you know we'll, we'll be recording that and talking about that in more detail. Um, a few questions about the research about did, was anybody with mosaic Down syndrome included um, and about other risk factors. Did you find anything you know, about celiac disease or Hirschsprung disease or any, any okay. other? Yeah, those are very good questions. Uh, uh, the uh, issue of uh, people having mosaic Down syndrome is a very interesting one. Um, we were not able to look at that in a lot of detail because uh, mosaic Down syndrome is relatively rare. So the number of people um, that had confirmed mosaic Down syndrome was quite small, which means that it's very difficult then to make uh, comparisons. Um, generally speaking, we uh, often observe that people with mosaic Down syndrome are, are, have fewer health concerns than uh, people with, um, with full trisomy 21, but I can't say what, what the case would be uh, in terms of risk for COVID-19. With regards to other health factors, so what we've had to do is to focus on the more common health issues in people with Down syndrome, such as thyroid problems or congenital heart conditions. Um, and so um, the rarer conditions that we know are more common in Down syndrome, but never, nevertheless still relatively rare, such as Hirschsprungs and so on, we were not able to look at in much detail. So I'm not able to, the risk factors that we looked at are summarized on the slide that I gave earlier, 
Um, so we're not, I can't really make comments on uh, some of the more rare conditions. Uh, thank you. Uh, quite a, a, an important question about ethnicity. So we know amongst the population generally that ethnicity is a, a consideration. Is there any reflection you might give on that for the population of people with Down syndrome? Yeah, that's presumably very the same issues that would apply. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so what we did when we compared with the general population, we just matched people by ethnicity and by age. So that we uh, sort of, uh, as we say in research, we controlled for that. Um, within people with Down syndrome, we did have um, people from different, different ethnic groups complete the survey. Um, but um, again, the numbers were relatively small and that makes it difficult to be clear. But um, having said that, I think now that we have more cases, so uh, today I've talked about uh, 800 or so people, but actually uh, the numbers are now bigger. It's uh, probably 1,000, 1,200 people. So we, we may be able to start to look at, uh, you know, uh, ethnicity factors and so on. The problem is also that uh, people from different countries have completed the survey. So you would have to sort of account for country as well as ethnicity, I think. Uh, and that makes it a bit more complicated. I think also ethnicity is quite a complex um, field anyway. So um, I, I do a lot of other work on um, working with people from different ethnicities in the UK not children with Down syndrome, but different people, um, add children in, from different ethnicities. And actually there's, there's, it becomes quite complex because it's that in, interplay of whether it's the ethnicity or whether it's the um, social cultural, um, it's the way people live together or it's something else. So, um, it, and it becomes quite difficult to actually break down ethnicities in, in is it, you know, is it the culture, it's the living environment, what is it? So I can just give an example of myself. So I know in my own home, if I, you know, we have, we have three children. I live with my mother-in-law, she's 84. She's got diabetes, she's got blood pressure. So just giving this as an example. So I have a multi-generational household because of the way my family structure is. Um, and that's sometimes more common in certain communities, sometimes not more common. And so you will be thinking about the risks, not necessarily due to the ethnicity, but because we're all living together. So we obviously have to be careful because we've got somebody vulnerable which may be with Down syndrome or may not be with Down syndrome. How many people have you got in the house? Um, how are you into, you know, how are you meeting people within the house? And it's the same, same sort of discussion about, well, if you have more people in a house for whatever reason, wash your hands, stay clean, um, keep apart from each other if somebody has higher risk factors than somebody else, wherever you can. And, and, and so I think we just have to be a little bit careful to try and, it, it, it can get very tied up and so to keep it simple if we think if you're vulnerable you're in a crowded house more people of course you have to just be even more careful of washing hands and keeping everything very clean and hygienic. Thank you and um, a, a question regarding um, congenital heart conditions is it are these or do, is there any information regarding whether these are children or adults who have had heart surgery so that the condition has sort of been repaired. Would, would, would you make any comments about that? Or is it children who still have a congenital heart condition that are awaiting surgery? Or you know, are there any differences in risk factor regarding that sort of status? So yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's yeah, that Monica will know that we found, we found lots of emails uh, with the data analysts that are helping us with that um, over the past week to, to see if we can tease that out a little bit more. Um, it looks like it is quite difficult. So at the moment, what we can say is that when we say uh, congenital heart conditions may be a risk for hospitalization, we mean um, all of uh, the age groups and also all of the people who have had a history of congenital heart conditions, whether it's been offered surgery or whether it didn't need surgery or not. So it's just lumping everybody together. Um, what it looks like is when we look specifically at children, um, uh, we didn't find the uh, issue with um, uh, uh, congenital heart uh, conditions being a strong risk factor. It was 
strangely more in adults, but it could be a number issue as well. So uh, it always makes it a bit more difficult. I would suspect though, that if people um, have significant heart issues remaining even after surgery, in other words, if they have um, pulmonary hypertension or other complications, then uh, we would, particularly if it affects the lungs as well, then we would expect the risk to be higher. So we would have to be careful, I would say, in people with very significant heart uh, problems. And if, if you, um, so the Royal College of Pediatrics have brought up guidance on different groups of individuals. And so I think I was alluding to that before. So the group where you have a, a recognized immune de immunodeficiency is in one group. Um, people, individuals who've had um, heart, who have heart problems ongoing, uh, consider to those children where you should have a dialogue with, you'll have a dialogue with your pediatrician or your GP and talk about what the risks are. Um, obviously, if you've, had a, if you've had a heart problem and it's a, a, been a very small minor heart problem um, and it's been, you know, the child had an operation when they were very young and it's all finished, it's all over, there's no treatment. That's a very, very different group of children than children who are having ongoing heart problems which may have other comorbidities or other, when we say comorbidities, other reasons for them having to see the doctor and maybe on ongoing medication. So again, sometimes we talk about heart conditions as though it's all the same and it's not. It's, there's very different types of heart conditions um, for, and needing very different types of treatment. So what we would urge people to say is go and have, the key I think message here is that Every child is an individual. Every child is different. We are giving general recommendations on how to keep children safe and healthy um, and adults, of course, but each child will have their own nuances. And so go and talk to your pediatrician and have that dialogue with them. And you'll come up to a, a plan that is helpful for you and for your child. Thank you. I'm I conscious of, oh, sorry, Andre, did you want to add anything? No, I, I, just, I just wanted to say that, sorry, uh, I would definitely agree with what Monica has uh, explained. Uh, I'm, I'm conscious of time, and, and there, there are two particular additional questions that I've got listed here, and then we might just see if we've got any mop-up questions, if, if there's time permitting. Um, it's sort of related to the issue about immunity that we we're just talking about. Is there any evidence to suggest that individuals who have Down syndrome are more likely to become infected with the, so we're looking at outcomes, you know, obviously hospitalizations and, and sadly deaths of, of individuals. But the question really is about, are people with Down syndrome more likely to contract the virus or is that, is there not information that you can share particularly on that? Um, well, so theoretically there is. Uh, so when we look at some of the the genes on chromosome 21 and the expression of those genes, it looks like um, people with Down syndrome may be at higher risk of contracting the virus, but we can't say for sure whether that is true or not, because uh, it's not, it hasn't been possible to examine that question uh, in detail. Hopefully in the future, when there's more data available on people who have been tested for COVID-19, um, within particular settings, perhaps then we would be able to um, um, get more information about that, but we can't say for sure at this stage. Thank you. Um, and then finally, a question that quite a number of people have asked in looking to the future with um, the potential of a, a COVID-19 vaccination becoming available. I mean, you may not know any more than is in the news generally about the sort of protocol for who might be eligible and what sort of prioritisation they will be given. Um, do you know anything or what would your feelings be about how, how, to what degree individuals with Down syndrome should be prioritised for being given the vaccination when it becomes available? Yeah, that's a good question. We've been asking that of uh, the NHS to uh, begin to think about that. Um, so presumably uh, one of the good, one of the positives of being added to the uh, vulnerable, the clinically vulnerable list um, for adults with Down syndrome is that um, it, it implies that they might be prioritised at some stage for, for a COVID-19 vaccine. So from that point of view, it's uh, potentially good news, but um, quite, as you, as you mentioned, we don't know what the plans are for rolling it out. And so we, we would have to wait and see. 
Thank you. I don't know whether my, my colleagues around the, the board may have been screening some of the other questions that have popped up in chat. Is there anybody that identifies a question that perhaps we've not taken? Um. One thing while you're waiting, just to, to as a take home message as well for everybody is, um, you just talked about the vaccine for, for um, um, COVID, but, but um, we have the flu vaccine that everybody is offered every year. And um, that has been ongoing for some time. Um, so just as a, a sharing, really a feeling of mine is that um, it's so important that ch children have the flu vaccine every year. And we ask everybody to have that every year. So this year is no different. So because there's a focus on COVID, please don't forget that still go and have your flu vaccine um, and still get your child immunized for flu. So that's one just push I'd make to everybody is don't get distracted because of the COVID and forget to have the flu vaccine. Exactly. Yeah. And the other thing I would uh, add to that is um, it's really important that people keep up to date with their health checks as well. So do go and see the GP, get your health check done. Uh, make sure that the person's health and medication has been optimized so that they're as healthy as possible. Yeah. And the same with children, we're still doing all the, we're still doing all assessments, whether some are virtual, whether some are face-to-face, -face, still doing all the blood, still checking for all their thyroid. So again, focus on keeping children and adults as healthy as possible within the environment that we're in. And you know, having seen the letters that have gone to GPs in England, that is made clear. In fact, it's suggested that the annual health check would, you know, make sure that the patients you have on your list who you know have Down syndrome, now is the time to make sure that you've carried out the health, annual health check and they are up to date with vaccinations and all the other sort of preventative um, measures that can be actioned. We have several questions that have come in um, really wondering if you have any comments about the BMJ article on which the government guidance was based or anything extra to say from your survey? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the data that was included in that survey was based on primary care data. So it's data that's collected from GP surgeries, a uh, large group of GP surgeries. Um, during you know uh, the recent months um and but uh, ultimately the numbers of people with down syndrome that were included and particularly the ones that have died of COVID-19 was relatively small much smaller than the data that we've presented here today uh, because we have conducted an international survey I suppose the strength of that study is that it has been you know it is UK based a primary care study one slight concern might be that um, I, I wonder if uh, there might be, uh, so maybe they've over included people with more severe presentations of COVID-19 because the reason why I say that is because uh, during the time, uh, the, the, the period that they've included, included the very early stage of the pandemic when people of course were not able to be, to, to go to their GP even um, even uh, when they had symptoms of COVID-19. So it may be that it's only the ones who were more severely affected that came to the attention in that study rather than people who, who, who had milder symptoms and perhaps that could have skewed things a little bit, but that's just conjecture, I can't be sure. Um, and uh, maybe future work would be able to, um, you know, we'll, we'll be able to examine that in more detail. I, th I think it's, you know, it's, it's like we said, all research is important, all research is relevant, and it's about um, actually trying to find ways of doing increasing research so we get more of the answers that, that we can then have this dialogue and, and, you know, have these discussions that we're having. So the more we can do, the better. Um, and um, I, I know um, that I've just been looking at the chat and there's lots of questions about Pneumovax as well. So again, I think it's quite important that um, in addition to the flu vaccine, um, um, to address the fact that Pneumovax, the pneumococcal vaccine is also very important. Um, and that's in children. Um, you can get that every five, five years as well. So um, just remember all your vaccinations and get them all up to date. Julian, uh, just, I was just going to say that for those, you know, for people who are interested, the leader study was published yesterday and Julian might want to say something about that. 
Yes, I mean, it, it was literally only released uh, about, well, less than 24 hours ago. So we've had a, a quick look at that. Um, and obviously these are individuals who sadly died in the first wave of the pandemic in, in the UK. So it was at a time when our understanding of how to treat the virus was very different. And obviously things like access to testing and PPE wasn't you know, what it is at the moment. A significant number of, so, so within that report, they have particularly identified adults who had Down syndrome who died. And the report only mentions adults. So there isn't any inclusion there of children who have died. So there is, you know, that can be reassuring. Um, they were generally adults who I think just under half of the individuals lived in residential care. So not in supported living. They were living in a care home. So our understanding might be that those were perhaps older adults with Down syndrome. And over half of the people who died also had a diagnosis of dementia. So clearly it's, you know, uh, very important that we look at the circumstances about that and there may be a lot that we can learn from um, the experience of those people and and you know it's why it's important that that report was published very quickly but it does I think put into context some of the questions about I have a 20 year old who's otherwise fit and well and at college and you know I think that there were other pre preventative measures that might have been helpful for those people that, that wouldn't perhaps apply in the same way to a younger adult who is, you know, living in the community or living at home with their, with their family. One final point that I think has come up, a couple of people have mentioned the differences within the UK nations. So we're well aware of the fact as an organisation that covers England, Wales and Northern Ireland, that there are differences in approaches. And this is across the board in regards to the policy relating to public health. So although the decision to add adults with Down syndrome to the clinically extremely vulnerable list is a, is a UK wide one, so it's all of the four um, chief medical officers have agreed that that is uh, appropriate. The way that the information has been communicated differs. So in England, GPs have been asked to contact the adults that they know of, and the GPs will be generating the letters and sending them. In Wales and Northern Ireland, the letters will be coming out centrally from public health and because England, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland were in national lockdowns, and well, the Wales one ended this Monday, this last Monday, Northern Ireland, I think, is still in a national lockdown. They have, they are only beginning to send those letters out, we think, probably either the end of this week or the beginning of next week. So there is a difference in approach of how the information is being communicated. We did make this point very early in discussions that that was slightly frustrating and clearly we felt it should be everybody getting the information at the same time but that is the difference between the devolved nations. Well we have nearly come to the end of our time um, so I'd like to say a very big thank you to Monica and to Andre for such an interesting presentation and um, we are recording this session we have posted the published results on our website and through our social media from um, T21RS. And we will be carrying on with a DSA update and letting you know about um, what we've been hearing and, and seeing and the feedback we've been giving to government with all of the concerns and many of which have been raised by people here. Monica and Andre, would you like to, to say anything else? And yeah, I'll let Andre give first. Sorry, uh, just to mention that we have uh, developed some infographics uh, that's very similar to the slides that I've presented today, which is available on the T21 RS website. But I think you're linking to that via the Down Syndrome uh, Association's website, isn't it? The DSA's website, yeah. Okay. And mine's just to wish everybody well. It's um, always a tricky time to navigate all these discussions, but um, we're coming into a festive season, and so just. Um, Make your houses very pretty with lots of colours for the children and um, and, and all, all keep well and safe. Thank Good you meeting. very much. I'll close the meeting now. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks.